Now he talks, the next section, he talks, it's, it's a strange section I find, um, and um, because he talks about how words are like accounts, like, um, like, like accounting, like, um, and, he, and he talks about the way in which um, you can look at words as if they were figures in your sort of accounting books. And if you're, if you're like a, a merchant and you're, you know, so you're, do, you're doing an, your accounts of your profits and your losses and your revenues and your expenses, um, all of those figures are like words, right? And he says, subject to names is whatsoever can enter into or be considered in an account. Right, and that's a, I mean, it's kind of a curious statement. Words are like numbers in these accounting books, right? Um, and he's got, well, the way he justifies this is, is first he uses these etymologies, right? He, he looks at the, the history of language in order to give us some conclusions about how language works. He says, language works like accounting money in Latin. So accounts of money were rationis, which is... Um, also a kind of word for rationality. Accounting was ratiocinatio, which also is sort of about reason, right? And items in accounting books were nomina, and nomina is also, is, it's, it's like the, the word for nouns, right? And so uh, items in your accounts, these figures were like, were, were called nomina in Latin, um, and ratio became reckoning, so reckoning in the, in the sense of uh, calculating, adding and subtracting, that's reckoning, right? But that's also, um, in, in Latin, also ratio reason, right? And, and there, he's saying that that process of calculation is the process of reason and that there is this um, overlap between the way uh, people accounted for things in their um, business accounting and for the, the way people use words um, as, um, as figures, I suppose, right? Um, in the same way in Greek, he says logos was both speech and reason because there's no reasoning without speech. Syllogism was reasoning because it was a summing up of consequences, and, and so he's relating the syllogism also to this summing up, this, this adding and subtracting, right? And so um, this is the, the primary evidence he gives us, which is a little thin, I think, as far as um, telling us the, the evidence for the relationship between words and numbers. So he's saying words are like numbers, and reason is like reckoning, like, like calculating. Um, so but I, I think there's a, there's a kind of a, I mean, as we go through his analysis, there's, a, there's another way of justifying this relationship, which has to do with um, just the way in which um, we, we arrive at words. What do we have to do in order to arrive at words? And he goes into a little bit more detail about this, um, but it's, it's not so clear. So I'm, gonna, I'm, <laughs> I'm adding a little bit to, to what he's doing, but really just in order to kind of highlight uh, the way he understands this process. So, um, basically, what he's you know what he's saying is that when you're when you're entering numbers into account, he's saying you're it's in in language you're turning something that's just kind of an amorphous thing. What we talked about before, we talked about like evidence. You're looking at something in the world, right? Um, we can look at you know we can look at this wall, right? Or we can look at a tree outside, and it's lots of things. There's lots of things that you could say about the wall, right? Um, but when you reduce it to a word. Um, you're taking that multiplicity of impressions and um, you're turning it into a unity. You're, you're, you're putting it into one category uh, and assigning that multiplicity to that one category. <coughs> so this is, you know, so, so I got my, my weird cloud, right, which is just, it's, it's the multiplicity. It's like you, you look at something and there's just, just lots of things you could, you could say about it uh, and you're, you're reducing it to just one word, right? And that's that's the process he's saying of um, turning something into an account, right? Re essentially kind of like reducing it to a number in accounting, we're reducing it uh, into a word in language, right? He doesn't really have an explanation for how this transformation happens, and we will be looking at other theorists who do have an explanation for this, but we're not gonna be looking at that now because he doesn't. But he recognizes that this process is necessary before any kind of reckoning in accounts, in accounting can occur, and also before any kind of reasoning can occur. You need to be able to take the multiplicity and reduce it to a unity, right? And, those, um, and that's then this process whereby lots of multiplicities, right, are reduced to different unities, and then they can be put in relationship to each other, right? He had the example of man as a living creature, right? Those are individual words. 
they are, before their words, I guess you, you can say that they're, they're just some multiple, they're just, you know, groups of impressions, and they're really not anything in particular until you've reduced it to something in particular, which is this word. And then once you've done that, it's kind of like the words are like little handles by which you can manipulate these, these groups of impressions and set them in relationship to each other, right? And that's the process that he's talking about when he's talking about this um, uh, definition of, of words, right? Where, where words need to be defined correctly in order then for you to be able to, to use reason at all, right? So, so the reasoning process has as its prerequisites uh, this definition of words, yeah? So um, he then goes in and, and he goes on and he talks about the different ways in which we categorize um, reality, I suppose, right? Because he says that there's different kinds of names, right? So, um, the, well, um, he, he, he actually gives us five categories of names, right? Of ca categories of words, right? The first one is names of matter, right? Which is basically sort of anything that's going on in the world and you give it a name or you, you, you describe it. Um, that's what he's talking about. So, you know, so the, the wall can be hot or cold or hard or soft. Um, tall or short or long or short, right? And those are all descriptions of matter, right? So that's the one way that you could reduce kind of uh, a multiplicity of impressions into one thing, right? Um, then he says, I mean, there's, you know, that's, th that's the basic way. But then the, he says, well, there's also these names of qualities, you know? So you can turn, turn hot as a description of, of something in the world into heat which then really is a general category, and it's not really describing anything in particular. It's just describing this category of hotness, of heat, right, which is detached from any, anything, right? There's, it's not actually talking about any kind of matter. They're abstract words that talk about something that's, that's being hot as if it were a thing itself. It's not obviously a thing itself, but it, it can be discussed as a general category uh, of of heat or length or, or life, right? And so those things, he says, they're, you know, they're not really describing things in the world exactly, but they're, they're describing these, these general um, abstract concepts, right? That you've, you've able to, through language, you're, you're able to turn into a word and then manipulate it as if it were a thing in the world, right? So that's like a, one of the, another sort of advantage of language is it allows you to take some, some property that's really an abstract thing, it's not a thing in the world, and uh, treat it as a thing for language, right? Next he says there's names of our fancies, and what he means by that is sort of our impressions of things, which are separate from how they really are in the world, right? Something may appear to us in a certain way, right? Um, and we're not considering it as it is, but really just how it appears to it, how it sounds to us. So, right, you know, something can be beautiful, something can be ugly, jarring, peaceful. All of these things are our impressions of those things that it might not, you know, it might not have anything to do with the thing itself, right? It's really talking about our reaction to those things. And we can have, he says that's a whole category of words that talks about our impressions of things, right? Um, so that's the, the third category. Then he talks about names of names themselves, right? So we can have um, general, universal, special, equivocal, and what he's saying there is those are words that are actually describing other words, right? So he's saying that, that those words are categories of words um, where we're, you know, taking a set of words and putting those in a certain category, kind of universal words, special words, equivocal words, right? Um, and he says that language allows us to do that, to do that as well, right? That, and then we, he's got this whole category of words that are, that are words for words or about words, yeah? Finally, he has negatives. Um, which he says are important because they signify that a name cannot be applied to the thing in question, right? And it's, it's kind of a, uh, a thing, you know, it's, it, where um, it, it's a way of avoiding falsehood by saying, oh, you can't apply that category to that thing, right? And, and sort of, you know, denying that relationship, right? And he says that's a whole other category of words for him as well, all the negatives which, um, which sort of admonish us not to make false connections in a sense, right? That's, that's saying, no, there's not that connection, right? So, um, so in, 
in defining language through this definition of words, um, Hobbes has, on the one hand, given us this idea that the construction of word is actually a pretty complicated process, right? Because it's, it's taking this multiplicity of things, reduce it to a unity, right? That, that process um, can't go on without creating a word. And it's also a, 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 it's a reduction, right? It's, it's, it's taking something that's, uh, that has lots of characteristics and really just focusing on one of those characteristics for, for whatever reason, right? Um, and, that, and he says when you do that, that, the possibility of doing that allows you the possibility of doing all sorts of other things with the words, right? It's, it's not just for, for looking at reality, it also allows you to, to, to carry out that same process with, um, with, with the characteristics you're using for reality, with our impressions of that are reality, with other words, and uh, with, with, neg um, with negatives, right? And so, um, so what, what I want to point out here is, th is the relationship then between what Hobbes is laying out and that process of reducing evidence to a reason that we talked about last time as essential for um, constructing an argument. It's the same process that he's describing, only he's describing it in terms of single words. We were describing it last time in terms of relationships between sentences, right? So it's, it's more complicated there, right? But it's really the same process, right? Because, you know, when, when we're talking about evidence, right, in, um, and how it relates to a reason, we said that with evidence, you're pointing to something, right? Say we're pointing to the wall, and then, but you're, um, in pointing to it, you're, you're reducing that evidence to a particular reason and not to a, a different reason. So you're, you're actually, creating this same kind of reduction of a multiplicity of impressions into a, uh, a single unity, right? And so what I want you to notice is that, that connection, that parallel that's going on. Hobbes is describing it with words. We were describing it last time with um, pieces of an argument. But it's the same process, right? Because it's the process, again, whereby you take a, a multiplicity and multiplicity and reduce it to a unity, right? Um, in one case, the unity is a word. The other case, the unity is actually a sentence. It's a, it's a reason, right? But it's, it's the same process. Okay. So, um, once he's gone through this process of definition, right, um, he then wants to explain to us the way in which you can run into problems um, with this process of definition, right? And he has a particular way, and because of the way he's understanding the, <coughs> the, the usefulness of the problem, he's got a particular way of understanding the problems, right? Um, so the first thing he, he says is that, that understanding, he's defining understanding, and understanding is conception caused by speech, right? So it's, it's a conception you have in your mind that's caused uh, by some kind of language, right? It occurs when someone, on hearing a speech, has those thoughts in the mind that those words were ordained and constituted to signify, right? So that's pretty basic, right? You know, you've got, you know, a set of words, they call to mind in our, our mind specific thoughts, and if you've got a relationship, that's, that's what's going on in understanding, right? Um, but then he says, well, understanding cannot take place when speech is insignificant or absurd. So he's got these two things, insignificant speech and absurd speech, and those are hindrances to understanding, and these are problems that, that really he wants to kind of get rid of, right? So um, one example he, he points out is, is new names whose meaning is not explained by definition, and they're, they're, you know, because there's a, there's a, you don't have a proper definition, um, he's, he's saying that you can't understand what's going on, there's, there, and he says that, that for, for that reason they're insignificant, right? So there's, there's a sense in which he wants to, 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 to ground language and also his own thinking in precise and accurate definitions, right? It's not entirely clear what that would mean though, right? I mean, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're using a word, you're using a word, is there some sense in which it's not been defined correctly through that process of reducing the multiplicity to, uh, to a unity? Uh, how would you judge that, right? And he doesn't really go into this. Um, but he's really kind of, he's setting up this idea of insignificant speech as some kind of 
deficiency in that process of moving from impression um, from the world to the, the unity of the word in, in the definition, right? So he, he, you know, he w because he's starting with this understanding of language as definition, he's kind of committed to, uh, I guess, right definitions uh, as opposed to wrong ones. Um, and, and that's how he's going to be judging different types of language. So, but he, you know, he, he hasn't actually, be, you know, be, he hasn't given us the full explanation of how the multiplicity gets reduced to unity, right? I told you he, he recognizes that it's necessary. He doesn't give us kind of the explanation of the mechanism for that, how that happens, right? And so there's actually then a kind of fuzziness here. And I would say that, you know, his own definition is a little bit fuzzy here about what it would mean for that definition process to be somehow deficient or insignificant, right? I mean, he, he says it, but he, it's, there's not a, a lot of explanation here, all right? The other thing that he, he points out to us is that um, names that, um, that combine two con contradictory terms are absurd and therefore also insignificant, right? Now, he gives us these examples, the incorporeal body, right? So the bodiless body um, or the round quadrangle, right? Are um, affirmations that are, as he says, are in themselves false and without meaning because they're, they're, they're contradictory, they're self-contradictory. Right, because they're linking two things that, that, are, that are opposite, that, that can't both exist at the same time. Right? He, he also gives these other examples, empowered virtue and inblown virtue uh, are also senseless because it doesn't make sense to, to talk about virtue being blown or powered. Right? Um, but what's interesting here is, I mean, you know, he, he, c he uses these terms and says that they're, they're, they're senseless, that we, we can't use them. In it. Uh, because they, you know, through this sort of definition process, there's no sense way in which you can understand what's going on. Um, but there's clearly a kind of, um, I guess, what would you call it? There's, a, there's an aesthetic effect, maybe, if you will, of these, of these terms. So, so if you talk about an incorporeal body, yes, it's, it's, it's absurd, it's contradictory. Um, but there might be a use in, in using this kind of a term. Um, or certainly with empowered virtue, there might be a, a reason to use that kind of term, even if it's not, if, if you can't say it's, it's, it's a literally a possible thing to have, right? So um, in a sense, he's, he's really objecting to a kind of, um, I suppose, aesthetic or playful use of language here, where, where you're using, you bring together contradictory terms in, in order to create a kind of effect, I suppose, but also really perhaps some, um, some new way of looking at things that includes this contradiction. And so he's, you know, he's excluding contradiction from language. Right? So that's, that comes partly from his idea of, of right definitions and the way n things have to be able to sort of build up from these right definitions and all sort of cohere like a set of accounts, like uh, you know, in, in bookkeeping, that everything has to kind of um, cash out into the, the correct sums in the end. But because of that approach to language, He's really, you know, he's become very suspicious to any kind of figurative use of language, right? Um, as these examples then indicate, right? That that we're, you know, we're we're talking about figurative uses and not literal uses, and he's really ac actually not allowing that kind of figurative use. Um, and he actually even more explicitly does this when he says that the names of things that affect us uh, by pleasing and displeasing are inconstant. Yeah, there's, you know, because, so the, precisely this aesthetic aspect of knowledge, uh, of language, that, uh, that could be either pleasing or displeasing, those are things that he's suspicious of because there, you know, there, there's no sense in which there's a, uh, a consistent way of using language um, in a way that pleases or displeases. So, because the, the effects, and you know, the first thing he says, the effects on people are variable. <coughs> different people will have, will be pleased or displeased by different types of language. Right? Even the same person, right? you, might, you might like one way of using language one day and not like it the next day. You know, it's, it's, it's so it's, people are flighty, I suppose. They change their mind. And so this, is, you know, this, this effect is inconstant and therefore he's, he's kind of suspicious. If he really wants language to be precise, pre precise and in a sense um, secure for all of eternity, I suppose, right? I mean, his, his big examples, uh, obviously, are, are mathematical ones, particularly from geometry, um, where you can say, oh, these are sort of eternally true, uh, 
true concepts and connections, and he really wants to um, create language in that way that has that kind of objectivity um, and eternal truth to them. Um, and in a sense, you know, you could say, I mean, if 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 he's if he was in fact an atheist, right, um, that. Um, he's opposing a kind of one notion of eternity to another notion of eternity, and his notion of eternity he really wants to ground on these types of um, mathematically oriented truths um, that don't admit of uh, contradiction and inconstancy. Right? Um, he's indicating also that language itself becomes very unpredictable once you admit these types of uses of language based on pleasure and displeasure because when we conceive of things differently we can't avoid naming them differently right so then all of a sudden his his neat account books get all messed up because you know what if you if you if you name one thing one way one day and then name it a different way the next day then obviously you can't really balance your books very well because your your terms are always changing right he recognizes this problem he sees that as a problem and he wants to some in in some sense kind of ex you know limit the effect of that problem, try and, try and make language much more predictable and constant, right? Um, and so, but you know, but it, it's very difficult for him to do this, right? I mean, he recognizes the difficulty, he just sort of, you know, says, you know, this, this, is, this is a problem that we have to deal with, right? So, uh, you know, one of the main issues is that words have this aspect of interpretation, right? That, that impairs their, their constancy. They're not, um, they're not regular because um, they're, they're always being interpreted, and that interpretation process belongs to the nature of language, right? Um, so, you know, what he says then is words bes besides signifying that, um, uh, that which we imagine of their nature have a signification also of the nature, disposition, and interest of the speaker, right? So because, it's, because language usage is so dependent upon the speaker that's using the language, um, it's, it can't be as objective as a set of bookkeeping books uh, for a business. Or it can't be as objective as, um, as geometrical proofs, right? There, there's, there's something about the position of the speaker that's going to affect um, the way the, uh, the language is being used and the, and the way the language is, be, is being understood, right? Um, so he, he gives them some examples. The names of virtues and vices are subject to this problem because, for instance, one man calls wisdom what another calleth fear, right? So you, you could be you're wise in, you know, I don't know, I don't know what are you, what are you, you're wise in not signing up um, to, to join the army, but maybe you're actually just, just a coward, right? And so those are two interpretations of the same action. Um, there's, who is to say which one is the right interpretation, right? It'll, it'll depend on who's, who's, who's speaking and who's listening, right? And he also even says then, metaphors and tropes of speech, so different figures of speech, are also always subject to this problem because um, they're always naturally going to be kind of um, figurative uses that are not literally true, right? And he says that um, even though this is a constant problem with metaphors, it's, it's a less severe problem because at least um, they announce their inconstancy, right? At least they're being upfront about the fact uh, that they're um, not literally true, right? But, you know, but, but again, you know, his, his standard for language is this kind of language that ha would have the same consistency and truth um, as, uh, as a set of accounting books, right?